misconceptions around uh, the ketogenic diet. So, uh, uh, so please welcome Dr. Sainz. Hi, thank you so, so much. A uh, big thank you for the invitation to come here. Uh, this conference, before I get started, like the topics are awesome. So I'm really excited to be part of adding a little bit to this body of knowledge. So I did have a different title for my talk, but I actually love this from the flyer so much. So we're here to talk about fat, fat, and more fat. So before I get started, um, no conflicts of interest to report. And I also wanna emphasize that because I am gonna be talking quite a bit about habitual diet and certain dietary prescriptions and approaches, that this is all data uh, and research-based. So make sure that if you're going to apply this in a personal sense, you connect with your medical and clinical professionals. Uh, but let's get started. Let's roll into it. So we're here to talk about ketogenic diets and performance. And really what I'm going to be doing during this talk is highlighting the research that's out there, more of the um, more of the current latest evidence that we have and how it's being used. But it's really difficult to dive into this topic and not acknowledge where our carbohydrates sit at the moment. So most of the time, especially as we talk about sports nutrition from a habitual dietary sense, we look at carbohydrates as king. And there's a strong reason for that. There's substantial evidence highlighting its um, its dominance from a habitual standpoint as we relate to performance and recovery from energy standpoints. So as a personal clinician, I know from um, our educational background and how we're taught about sport nutrition and a lot of how we prescribe it. And quite frankly, if this information wasn't out there, how athletes naturally eat tends to be on a moderate to higher carbohydrate approach. And so that includes starchy vegetables, um, starchy or carbohydrates in general, fruits, vegetables, and then we really lean on our proteins for both performance and recovery. So these are standard approaches in sport nutrition. Um, but it does beg the question why we're talking about ketogenic diets. And if, if we just take a step back and look at it more from a marketing standpoint, uh, at the moment, there's no there's no um, way to avoid how, how much it's exploding in the field. From a marketing standpoint, we're seeing the ketogenic diet market explode. We're seeing this grow exponentially. Uh, quickly, I had some statistics there that in the past four years, the word keto has been Googled over an increase of 850%. That is a huge, enormous amount. And while we don't have any objective data to say how the sports nutrition market is growing for ketogenic diets, we just do have a general sense that we're seeing a lot more products out there. We're seeing a lot more marketing towards ketogenic diets, a lot more conferences. Um, and what happens so commonly is that we see athletes really pushing forward with this or the consumer really pushing forward, but research is a little bit slower to catch up on the ins and outs and how to handle this objectively. So at the bottom line, we understand that athletes are turning to ketogenic diets, but we also know that mo most of research is from a standardized carbohydrate viewpoint. So one way I'm gonna string this together for our talk is just asking the question on if we understand and we have substantial evidence to highlight that carbohydrates work from a performance standpoint, then what could possibly be motivating an individual to completely flip their plates? Uh, to completely change the approach that they're going to take and completely shift how they're going to look at sports nutrition and performance nutrition. Uh, before we jump into this topic, I do want to highlight two things. One, I actually don't have data for what's the motivation for adapting a ketogenic diet, but I want to highlight that this research is going on. I'm, I'm not part of the lab that's doing it. There's several labs that are doing it around the world because it's such an interesting topic. Why would you switch when we know and have research, not just on higher carbohydrate diets, but also carb periodization and other fluctuations and dietary approaches that seem to make more logical, physiological sense from the way that we've been taught. Um, so this, the way I'm approaching the research is more from common questions that we get and what the research states. Um, and the second part of this is that before we start talking about how a ketogenic diet affects physiology and how it affects performance, then we got to get on the same page on what a ketogenic diet is. So for the purpose of this presentation, we're looking at a ketogenic diet as anything that is high fat, moderate protein, carbohydrate restricted, but not void of carbohydrate, uh, which is nearly impossible unless you're just chugging 
olive oil all day. And the ketogenic diet is also one that's going to place you into nutritional ketosis without sacrificing caloric intake. So we're not looking at intermittent fasting or decreased um, calorie intake. We are looking at eucaloric diets for the most part or matched calorie dietary approaches. And the breakdown of a ketogenic diet, if you're looking at the, the percentages there, are very distinct from an athletic population than a clinical population. This will be something that I mentioned continuously. So ultimately our goal is to still, still include the essential nutrients, still include proper fluids, still include proper calories. We're just flipping around those two energy, um, carbohydrate and fat substrates. The other thing I wanna chat about is what does a ketogenic diet actually look like? So this is often what we think about. We think really high fat, protein sources, and it tends to get a little bit funky. Um, for anybody that has worked with an individual that's trying to fat adapt and just not finding a lot of success, often we can go back to the dietary breakdown and see you might be eating too much bacon, if that's even possible. So a ketogenic diet and the dietary approach that I'm talking about is a well-formulated ketogenic diet. So what does that mean? That means that it's rich in vegetables, non-starchy vegetables, and um, high-fiber fruits, a lot of different types of proteins. Um, so it's not carbohydrate restricted, but it's also not maximizing. Um, it's not, oh, I'm sorry, it's not protein restricted as we might see in some of the clinical diets, but it's also not going to be your 30% for most athletes, but I'll talk about that in a second. I um, mean, it also has a wide variety of fats. So it's a, it's a lot more variety than I think we give it credit, especially when we're talking at, about athletic populations. So I'm going to I'm going to pause on this slide to just discuss the practical application quickly on a ketogenic diet because we're talking about a sport active exercising for the most part healthy population. We often visualize the ketogenic diets that are prescribed for clinical populations and the ones for clinical populations do tend to be a lot more structured. They tend to be a lot more defined because there are certain considerations for how it affects the neurological aspects of the clinical population, brain energetics of the clinical population, and particularly metabolic health. When we're talking about an athletic population, we have much more freedom because our calorie ranges are different, our carbohydrate sensitivity um, and approach is going to be different, and our timing of meals is going to be very different. So again, a ketogenic diet in an athletic population is one that allows us to increase and ingest all of the nutrients we need but maintain nutritional ketosis at a sustained level. And for this talk specifically, we're not just talking ketogenic diets, we are going into, we're going into it, we're going into keto adaptation. The definition of keto adaptation for this particular talk is a sustained consistent nutritional ketosis defined as 0.5 millimoles per liter to about 3.0 or 5.0 millimoles per liter. Nutritional ketosis typically occurs after a couple of days of carbohydrate restriction uh, but truly it could happen even after an overnight fast. So nutritional ketosis isn't something unusual for our body. We're well equipped to, to reach it. The part that keto, that a ketogenic diet continues to translate into is keto adaptation. So keto adaptation is when we're at that keto adapted state for about three, minimum of three to four weeks, but really more like three to six weeks and then beyond that six week mark. I also wanna make a distinction that we are talking about nutritional ketosis and keto adaptation, not ketoacidosis, which is a metabolic, uh, a metabolic disaster. It's one that requires immediate medical attention and it typically occurs in type one or often undiagnosed type two diabetics. This is a life-threatening um, life -threatening crisis for the body, very different than what we're talking about. Keto adaptation, again, is a natural occurrence in the body and a natural phenomenon that allows you to adapt to fat. So what keto adaptation refers to is we restrict our carbohydrates, but we increase our fat stores. So we are still eucaloric. We're still enough energy. We restrict the carbohydrates, increase fat. We may maintain, possibly fluctuate protein accordingly, and it allows us to then mobilize and oxidize more fat for energy. As we do those, um, as we metabolize more fat, one of the byproducts of fat metabolism is a ketone body. This occurs even without carbohydrate restriction. The difference is that now we're mobilizing and oxidizing so much fat that ketone bodies increase in circulation very slightly. 
This distinct increase in circulation of ketones is what gives it that keto-adapted name. It's also what ends up being the key marker of many of the metabolic adaptations we observe, phenotypic characteristics we observe, and also some of those epigenetic effects that we'll discuss in a little bit. Keto adaptation is a very unique physiological state. We typically tend to say about three to six weeks, but those initial weeks are what we call the metabolic adaptations. And we always get the question of, um, or often it's asked, you know, why does it have to take so long? And just to take a step back, you're asking your entire body to switch into a fat adapted state. So there are certain enzymes that have to increase, so certain hormone responses that have to occur and certain cellular structures that have to adapt to this new setting in the body. Now you are equipped to do this. In fact, what we've learned is that through genetic studies, these are conserved regions of the genome, meaning the body is ready to switch into that. Often it's, um, it's used in other settings as well. So in survival tactics, it's extreme calorie restriction um, or dur during certain uh, dietary shifts. So keto adaptation being a perfect example. But again, this is not necessarily calorie reduced. We're just switching it. Uh, the other aspects of a ketogenic, of keto adaptation is that while the first couple of weeks are metabolic in nature, there is a series of, of shifts that occur that we're just learning about now that might take several weeks to several months. So at the moment, we actually don't have a full timeline of what keto adaptation looks like. So all the shifts that occur and when. So for example, when do the kidneys start to adjust? At what point do we notice some of those brain energetics adjust? And what are those cellular markers that let us know, okay, this is a full keto adaptive state. So for our conversation and a lot of what's discussed at the moment, we accept keto adaptation as those first couple of weeks once the metabolic shifts occur with an understanding that other shifts are occurring down the line, but we just don't have that well documented yet. So let's get to the good stuff. We wanna know how keto adaptation affects us in a variety of ways. So specifically metabolic adaptations, the exercise phys that's involved, and then finally the big bucket, are we going to win if we're doing this? So when it comes to energy metabolism and keto adaptation, this is probably one of the most consistent phenotypes that we observe. And what that means is that those that are carbohydrate restricted with an increase of fat, again, maintaining calories, it's very consistent to see that they now start leaning on fat more. This is both at rest and during exercise. There's also a consistent trait where there's a decreased reliance on muscle glycogen. So this has been shown in several studies. I'm gonna highlight this particular study, which is the FASTER study, which I was a part of um, and was my dissertation. So in the FASTER study, we looked at highly competitive elite level ultra endurance men. And in, these and in this group, they were pretty similar in terms of competition and their approaches to training. Their major, major differences is that they were each, that each group was following distinct dietary approaches. Something very unique about the FASTER study that isn't available uh, that we haven't been able to replicate just yet, so it's very novel in this sense, is that these particular athletes were following their diets for a minimum of six months, but most of them 12 months and beyond. So they were on it for quite a bit of time, and also they self-selected into this diet. So this particular study isn't looking at performance. It's not comparing what's better. It's very much trying to better understand what are the differences and metabolic differences between these two particular groups. So that's that's really, really important because we're not, we wanted them to be equal in all other senses. So uh, there's several publications that have come out from this study. There's more to come, hopefully. And just to base, to review the basic study design, we had these athletes come in from all over the world, all over the world. Uh, they came to our lab at the time, which was the University of Connecticut. We were able to do a VO2 max on them uh, the day before testing. They all had um, similar meals that were reflective of their dietary approaches that night. The next day was our experimental approach, which is that middle portion you're seeing there with the guy on the treadmill. So it was a lot of fun. They got to run on a treadmill for three hours. Uh, different definition than what I call fun, but these were ultra endurance guys. So they were running at 65% of that VO2 max. And that was really the crux of the study. We were able to collect markers before during the run, immediately after the run, and in the recovery stage. So the markers that I'm going to talk about today is that we were able to do um, metabolic rates throughout, and then also muscle samples. 
What we found as it relates to energy metabolism, so this is the first of two slides in this particular section, and one of the big things that we observed is that ketogenic diets, those that were following the ketogenic diet, were able to oxidize more fat during that VO2 max. So at higher intensities, they were able to oxidize more fat than their high carbohydrate counterparts. Now, this isn't a dig at those that were following the high carbohydrate diet. Those that were following the high carbohydrate diet were mobilizing fat. I mean, these were super well-trained, highly, highly elite athletes um, in the top of the sport. So they were, if we're looking at the, um, the graphic that I have up, the high carbohydrate athletes were oxidizing close to two, um, close to two grams a minute of fat. When we compare that to the ketogenic diet athletes, they were mobilizing close to two and a half times that of fat. So they were mobilizing quite a bit at the same intensities. When we bring that out to what it looks like during the three hour run, we see a lot of what we've observed in other research studies. So pretty consistent in the literature that high, carbo high carbohydrate based athletes were util utilizing a mixed dietary approach or leaning more on carbohydrate sources of energy throughout the three hour run. And it varied during different time points, but one of the big aspects is that it was statistically significant between the ketogenic diet almost at all time points where the ketogenic diet group was leaning more on fat-based energy. So a very consistent phenotype, if you're fat adapted, you're leaning more on fat-based substrates. This doesn't necessarily mean that it's better for performance, it's just highlighting how different the metabolic approaches are. The next thing that is a very consistent phenotype that we see with ketogenic diets um, is body composition improvements. So again, this is separate from um, caloric manipulation. There are some studies that will play around with calories, but even when it's a eucaloric diet, we're observing body composition improvements consistently. And this is very true in ketogenic diets, but in general with carbohydrate restriction, even just a slight a bit, a slight amount, you're able to see improvements in body composition in relationship to decrease fat mass and either maintenance of lean mass or increase in lean mass, depending on what the exercise variables were. The slide I'm going to harp on a little bit more is this next slide for body composition, which is a recent publication out of our lab here at Jacksonville University. This was based off of the GLOW study. This one is particularly unique because there were a few caloric, there was calorie maintenance throughout the entire study, and there was no exercise intervention in this particular one. Uh, we hope to do a follow-up with exercise, so if there's any collaborators out there, uh, but without even the exercise component, we asked them to maintain activity as consistent as they possibly could um, and try to control what we could when it comes to these human-based interventions. These women were on ketogenic diets for three weeks, and it was um, in nutritional ketosis sustained, and it was also a free living, more of an intuitive eating style approach. So we weren't giving them strict dietary plans. We were bringing in a lot of education and a lot of support. They ran with it. And what we found at the end of the three weeks is that despite consistent calories throughout the study, fat mass decreased post um, compared to their high carbohydrate intake at the start, but fat free mass stayed consistent. So again, these um, consistent phenotypes of body composition improving. Let's talk about performance. So we understand that energy metabolism certainly shifts when you change around macronutrient composition of a diet. It's a consistent trait that body composition is going to shift when you change around macronutrients of a diet. So what about performance? And the top portion of each, of each section is highlighting some of the characteristics that we observe in ketogenic diets with these particular athletes. But the big question is, do they actually win more? Can we, can we dominate performance if we switch the diet? Or do we fall flat on our face? And at the moment, um, we're less looking at competition specifically or what's available in the literature is more performance markers. But what we're, we're observing is that there's typically either no change in performance or we do observe performance um, decrements depending on the athlete, the type of study, um, and if they adapt it, if, if a ketogenic diet was appropriate for that particular sport. So when it comes to performance, it's very, very variable. In one hand, especially one that seems to be fairly consistent is in our strength and um, less strength and power, but more of our strength athletes 
there seems to be no difference in muscular strength specifically when we compare it to a high carbohydrate, um, high carbohydrate based athlete. So this is fairly consistent in the literature. There are some rare situations where we'll see an increase in strength more from that power to weight ratio perspective. And then there are the situations where we see a decrement in strength. More consistent is really no change. So this particular study came out of a great team um, in Italy, Dr. Paoli's team, and they were looking at competitive natural bodybuilders. And they put these athletes on, they split the groups, put them on like either a ketogenic diet or allowed them to maintain a Western diet for two months, so about eight weeks. And they did one RMs before and after. These were competitive athletes, so they seemed to be in their strength phase. It was a non-competition, it was out of competition season, more they're working on their particular lifts. And what we found, or what we, what I wish we found, but what this particular team found was that there were no significant differences between um, their squat or bench press numbers. So both teams were able to increase and they increased in about, in no statistical difference between that volume of increase. So we've got some data there. When we switch over to more of our speed and sprint based athletes, we do seem to notice performance decrements in this particular group. Um, and this is a really strong, strong team who works quite a bit in ketogenic diets and what they were able to find are some of those consistent phenotypes. It improves body composition, but when it comes to um, any type of power work, it seems to fairly consistently show it might not be the best approach. This particular team took these team of athletes and adapted them for something similar about eight weeks also, we're tracking nutritional ketosis throughout to identify keto adaptation. And what they found is that all participants decreased in time to exhaustion. So that particular variable did seem to have a decrement. At the same time, there seemed to be varied responses for peak power. It either improved, interestingly enough, or stayed the same, which seems to be more consistent in the literature. Um, and ventilatory thresholds seem to improve or stay the same. But what we're seeing is that in these anaerobic approaches, ketogenic diets may not be appropriate, especially if it's more of that classic ketogenic diet where you're not necessarily manipulating carbohydrates even around that bad of exercise. What's a really interesting thing from this particular study is that we note that the authors reported that there were some negative experiences from the athletes. They're feeling tired and they're feeling a loss of power, even that extended all the way through the study. However, there's these other aspects, which brings us back to what's the motivation to an athlete following a ketogenic diet. And there's these other aspects that they seem to report. These seem to be very consistently what's reported anecdotally. Now we can't lean much on the anecdotal evidence, so we need some objective data. And that's where I'm really excited that some of these research studies are surveying individuals, like why are you going towards this? What's the reason and what are you hoping to accomplish? Because if everything's going perfect, you're probably not switching your dietary your approach. There's gotta be a reason that's triggering it. And they were finding that in general, the athletes just said that they felt better. They have these improved recovery, which we are observing these differences in animal models. So we need that, we need that in humans. Their skin conditions improved, which is always an interesting one. And it does seem to relate and reflect what's coming out of the dermatology clinical research. And it also helps reduce what they perceived as inflammation. So we need data to help identify more about what's going on in these situations. And that brings us to that ketogenic diets just are very, very unique in that their effects extend well beyond energy metabolism. And they seem to have this systemic effect on other aspects of the body. And the mechanisms can be drilled down to some cellular epigenetic effects. Um, this is where my dissertation focused. Um, most of the research available at the moment is in energy models and does seem to highlight that there are some sort of protective models protective mechanisms to nutritional ketosis. We have to elucidate what that means more, but what it might translate to or what it's being looked into further is how does it affect your recovery and possible longevity. Um, with that being said, in the FASTER study in the dissertation, we're able to, I, to take muscle samples. We did whole transcriptomic analysis and we're currently digging into that deeper. So we've completed our primary analyses and we're now doing secondary analyses. So hopefully uh, working towards that paper publication. So I'm echoing uh, Dr. Ormsby here that it is a bear to publish this particular paper, but it is coming, don't you wait. Uh, and what's really interesting is again, we're not looking at who's better or who's worse between these two 
high carb or low carb groups, we're looking at what's different and what might be some of the underlying reasons why they're different. So these are four of the 24,000 genes that we transcribed. And what's really interesting about these is that I could take away the labels and you'll still be able to identify these distinct differences between high carb and low carb group. These particular um, genes are mostly related to energy metabolism, but there have been other things that have come out as well. So we're trying to dive into this research a lot further. So in this whole big picture, I think one of the big things that we have to keep in mind as it relates to ketogenic diet research is that it's very new. We have decades and decades and decades of sport nutrition research that relies more heavily on a higher, a higher carbohydrate athlete, or it just assumes a higher, carbohydrate, a higher carbohydrate athlete. And so research and diet adaptation as it relates to ketogenic diets is very new. Um, all the sports nutrition needs to continue to grow and I'm excited to see where the field goes. Along with that, the ketogenic diet in athletics needs to grow as well. One of the biggest challenges that I observe is still that diet adaptation. We assume that the clinical diet is the same one we're using in athletics. And for those of us that are clinicians working in ketogenic diets, well aware that that's not true at all. Our calorie considerations are different. The electrolyte considerations are different. Our protein consumption is very different um, and our variety of, of food. Not to mention athletes have a full life. They're traveling, they might be consuming alcohol, they might be going through all sorts of recovery tactics. So the diet adaptation for a ketogenic diet in, a, in an athlete is distinct. So we need to have that be more reflected in research. The other time, the other challenge in the research is that adaptation period where three weeks is a minimum. But as I mentioned, you're asking your entire body to shift and change. So we need to start seeing some research that allows us to understand that keto adapted timeline um, that extends into several months. Not again, not to identify is this better or worse, but just to identify what's different and what's happening and how do we optimize it or when is it appropriate to use and when is it not appropriate to use. Um, one of the big aspects that I, I mentioned con considerably when I talk about ketogenic diets in front of sport teams is that we're comparing a lot of apples to fat adapted apples. So we're assuming again that fat adaptation looks the same and the reason looks the same in all populations and our motivation is just the opposite of high carb. High carb gives us energy, maybe fat adapt, adaptation will give us more energy. That's probably not the primary motivation that's coming out of this. Re and this is what we're learning out of this research. The primary adaptation or the primary motivation for becoming fat adapted might extend well beyond energy. So this again, shouldn't be a what's better. It is why is an individual doing it and how can we maximize those particular variables for that individual or that group of individuals. And uh, repeated consistently is that sport nutrition and keto adaptation is growing, but there's no, no question that there just is not enough information out there. So I highlighted a couple of key questions that still remain, but this list could go on and on. We could do a talk just on this. Um, and I wanna highlight this this particular top line here on how does carb periodization fit into the picture of keto adaptation, I think that's a question that could really um, make sport nutrition interesting. Most athletes are not just high carb. So I'm also in this talk creating that distinction as if they're high carb or low carb. That's not the case at all. Most athletes are all over the place and they very much reflect in season or out of season or they're just living life. So how can we make this more accessible how can we bring some good um, and easier to sustain data for an athlete to be able to adapt this into their overall picture? So in summary, ketogenic diets are rising in popularity, very much so. The challenge is that a lot of the research we have available is from clinical populations and we translate that to athletic populations. So we need to more hone in on what the athletic, um, the athletic evidence is saying. And what we're finding is that there are some consistent phenotypes. There is an increased reliance on endogenous sources of fats, so our own sources of fat. There is a decreased reliance on carbohydrate sources of fat. Um, it does seem to have some effect on body composition pretty consistently, and there are epigenetic effects that are occurring that quite frankly, we're not sure what that means. Um, but lastly, we're not sure, we're also not sure how that affects performance. Is it better, is it worse, or is it just different? Um, we should then take that information as practitioners and make sure that we are giving those that are going to be keto adapted, that updated information like, hey, this might help you in this aspect, but it may hurt you in this aspect. 
what is your goal and what's your motivation? And what I continue to repeat is that diet design is key. And we didn't go into it in this particular talk. We can do an entire one on how to design a diet for a ketogenic athlete, um, but that's, that's really a make or break in the process. So a big thank you uh, to the whole group and happy to take any questions. I don't know if there's time, but, but I'm excited to talk more. Yeah, that's a, that was a great talk. Um, there are several questions in the Q&A box and also in the chat box, if you don't mind answering those. Um, yes. And so we're going to move on to the next speaker because uh, we, in the interest of time, and, and I'm also getting quite hungry.